All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. Good to see you all here bright and early. I'm going to go ahead and get us um, started while folks are still trickling in. So just a few housekeeping reminders. Uh, make sure if you're pra tracking professional development hours, use the scanners out front. And if you're taking Florida licensure credits, sign in and access your PDH attendance records to the conference. Use the mobile app. All right, so I am so pleased to have you here today and welcome you to ASLA's Climate Action Plan, A Vision for 2040, and introduce you to our esteemed speakers. Uh, joining me up on the stage, Vaughn Renner, Sarah Fitzgerald, Diane Jones-Allen, and Jose Almanyana. All right, here are our learning objectives, which we'll get into. Oh, and by the way, my name is Pamela Conrad. <laughs> uh, I um, as an, originally a farm girl from Missouri and um, someone that didn't even know if they would be able to go to college. I am both humbled and honored to be in front of you today as a landscape architect to talk about something that matters very much to me. Now, with Martha Schwartz and I stood up here at this conference five years ago uh, at that conference for the very first time to talk about taking climate action, uh, I know that there were some of you that were here just to hear the amazing Martha Schwartz talk, um, but I also know that many of you were here, um, were there that day because you deeply care about this issue and is what has propelled us to this point in time. So we are so pleased to share an overview today with you of the ASLA Climate Action Plan, and we hope that this will provide you with a high-level understanding of the vision and the why, the goals, the process, who was involved, what the plan includes, next steps, and how to get involved. Now, after the presentation, I'm afraid we will probably take most of this time actually walking you through the details of the plan. What we're going to do is go into the practice base camp session. We'll have an hour of discussion, conversation, Q&A. So um, we hope that you will join us there afterwards. And now, most importantly, in that session, we really want to make sure that we hear from you um, what we can do to support you as ambassadors of implementing this plan. So first, we'd like to start off with acknowledging that the American Society of Landscape Architects recognizes that indigenous peoples are the original sovereign nations and stewards of these lands where we practice. Our work occurs on the unceded lands of many native nations, and it is with respect that we honor and collaborate with today's over 800 native nations to better understand the relationship between indigenous peoples and this land. We also recognize that the U.S. has been built on forced labor of African descendants. Our society and its landscapes are the heirs and benefactors of their coerced struggle, which we recognize and we seek to rectify. Through our actions, we wish to move forward towards creating collaborative, accountable, and respectable relationships. Now, while we live in unprecedented times that we all know about, ASLA has developed this climate action plan in the spirit of great optimism. We envision communities becoming healthier and economically stronger because they have committed to drawing down carbon, restoring ecosystems, and increasing biodiversity while reducing reliance on automobiles, all while ensuring that everyone in their community has equitable access to all of these benefits. Now, we know that many of us as landscape architects are already partnering with communities to achieve this vision. But as we increasingly experience the escalating impacts of the climate and biodiversity crises, we know that we need to act faster. We are uniquely qualified as design professionals that can bring all the pieces together and plan and design with communities to prepare them for a changing world. 
How ASLA envisions landscape architects in their own, in small and medium and large firms, in nonprofit organizations, in community groups, in public practice, and in academia, leading the way to a healthier, more resilient future. We envision landscape architecture firms enjoying greater economic success because of their early embrace of ambitious zero carbon emissions goals. Now we do understand that achieving this vision will depend on creating change in our own business operations and the entire supply chain of products and services that are part of designed landscapes. We envision leveraging our collective power and growing new partnerships with industry partners that will help us to achieve a zero emission profession by the year 2040. Now, this path forward will not be easy. We recognize that. But by leading now, we can ensure that this transformation will be rooted in nature, in equity, and zero emissions growth. Now, this plan represents the value of all landscape architects who want to see communities thrive far into the future. Our vision for 2040 is that landscape architecture projects will simultaneously achieve zero embodied and operational emissions and increase carbon sequestration, provide significant economic benefits in the form of measurable ecosystem services, health co-benefits, and green jobs, address climate injustices, empower communities, and increase equitable distribution of climate investments, and restore ecosystems and protect, conserve, and enhance biodiversity. <coughs> the global challenge that we face is that the IPCC has found that humanity can only put a maximum of 340 more gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere if we want a good chance of only increasing temperatures by one and a half degrees Celsius instead of two degrees. Now this requires that we reduce emissions by 50 to 65% by the year 2030 and reach zero emissions by 2040. Why that matters is because if we can stay within the one and a half degree temperature increase versus the two, we can prevent 1.7 billion people from being exposed to severe heat waves every five years and 100 to 400 million people to not be at risk of hunger and one to two billion people that would no longer have adequate to water, and a billion people being forced to migrate. That's why this matters. This is a call to action to the escalating climate crisis. And it's an opportunity for landscape architects to elevate their role. To get on a pathway to zero emissions, ASLA is taking a significant step forward with this climate action plan. The Climate Action Plan will divide, not divide, it will guide um, the development of policies and programs through 2040 by ASLA. Now, in, it is in direct response to members expressing their desire for guidance. So all of you, so thank you for speaking up and asking for this. It's also in response to chapter and CAC requests and recommendations, and it was identified in ASLA's recent strategic plan. It's been informed by prior ASLA Climate Advocacy Guide guidance and the Climate Action Survey that went out earlier this year. Now, your esteemed task force up here, which joins me on the stage, um, we started this work um, earlier this year by analyzing that survey that was put out to all ASLA members. And it was with this goal of ensuring that the plan is going to serve all of your needs. Now, beyond informing the framing of this document, um, many of those suggestions have been included within the specific actions of the plan itself. Now, what we heard in that Climate Action Plan survey, um, which was pretty amazing, there were over 400 responses from all of you. Uh, we heard a strong preference to advance advocacy and policy and member guidance resources. Um, also, to highlight biodiversity and nature-based solutions to, sh to help support increased credibility, collaboration, and communication opportunities. And there was an emphasis on providing resources that can be applied now.
So after several months of pretty intense work, uh, the Climate Action Plan Task Force wrapped up our work and got it ready for launch this weekend. So ASLA and myself personally is grateful for all the contributions that made this plan possible and extend appreciation to the ASLA staff team. Um, eight members contributed in particular, Tori and Katie and Jared who are amazing. Um, the ASLA task force, the co-authors of this effort that are up here on stage today, the Climate Action Committee. Uh, we also had an advisory group of 17 members. Uh, it was a diverse group of people, a wide range of expertise from private practice to public, academic, small and large firms, all around the country, and the very thoughtful over 200 or so um, comments. <laughs> we were very much appreciated and incorporated into the plan. So in addition, we want to recognize our allied organizations, in particular to IFLA, um, that spearheaded the Climate Action Commitment last year, AILA, CSLA, and the Landscape Institute for their climate action efforts, which also informed this work. So the plan structure itself um, includes two documents. For those of you that have already gone to the website and downloaded, you'll see that. Um, if not, please, please download it today. Um, and it outlines ambitious goals and actions that will be taken from between now and through 2025. The plan charts out a path of action for ASLA. So it provides guidance and timeframes uh, to roll out initiatives for the organization and for its members. And then the field guide for ASLA members sets out steps for the design and planning of projects as long with um, plans for business operations to achieve adaptation and mitigation goals. Uh, the guide outlines strategies to advance equitable policies, oversights, and collaboration. Now each document is organized around three goal topics. So that's practice, equity, and advocacy. And under these three topics, you'll see that the documents expand on the six initiatives that were outlined in the IFLA Climate Action Commitment, of which ASLA was a signatory last year. So the three goals that I mentioned that are overarching uh, for this effort are the first of practice to scale up climate positive approaches, the second equity so to empower communities, and the third advocacy to build coalitions. Now to support the global advocacy in 2021, ASLA, as I mentioned, signed the Climate Action Commitment um, from IFLA, which was presented at COP26 in Glasgow. And the commitment represents support from over 70,000 landscape architects around the world from 77 different nations that are committed to taking climate action. Now, the Climate Action Plan is organized by these six initiatives shown here and which we're going to be walking you through today. So what's generally included in the plan? Um, you can kind of see the breakdown of the list here, but generally it outlines objectives and actions that have been developed in support of each of those commitments. And then the field guide further expands on the action items that you as members can take, along with different resources that you can explore. And then each area outlines topic and top priorities for climate action, and they're supported by more in-depth toolkits that you can integrate um, directly into your work through strategies and techniques. So um, we're not going to be going into exhaustive detail here, but I'm going to walk you through some of the key aspects of the plan, um, starting in the practice section with the carbon drawdown initiative, and then I'll pass it over to my colleagues. So by through implementing this climate action plan, we will dramatically reduce operational and embodied carbon emissions produced through our work harnessing the unique capacity of landscapes to draw down carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and advocate for clean and multimodal transit systems. Now, to support global action, we have set the target for landscape projects to reach zero emissions by 2040 while providing economic, environmental, social, and cultural co-benefits, co including increased sequestration and biodiversity. Now, ASLA will be supporting you as its members firms and organizations in achieving zero emission business operations, zero emission landscape architecture projects, zero emission economic growth, and zero emission landscape architecture product marketplace. So we as landscape architects can accelerate this drawdown with nature-based strategies and smart planning, design, and specification. And ASLA is going to be providing guidance, and education, and training, and research to support our efforts. Now, the first objective is to design climate-positive landscapes. 
through the Carbon Drawdown Initiative. Some of the key strategies include measuring and improving the embodied carbon footprint of your projects, reducing operational carbon emissions, eliminating emissions through site impacts, and increasing carbon sequestration through nature-based solutions. The second is to design pedestrian, cyclist, and public transit-centric communities. And some of the key strategies include designing for walkability, supporting public transit communities, and integrating bicycle networks. And the third is to reduce energy usage and support renewables. And some of those strategies include reducing building and infrastructure energy usage, supporting renewables, and, renewing and reducing the carbon footprint of your business operations. Now, there are many ways that we can measure success, but some of the key four metrics include meeting the climate positive design challenge, so targeting a 50 to 65% emissions reductions by 2030, and reaching zero emissions by 2040, and doubling sequestration all along. Also, ASLA is, will be launching a climate award going forward and helping to roll out a climate and biodiversity positive commitment. Um, also, that we are meeting our sites and leads carbon credits, and then achieving a Trust for Public Land 10-minute walk score on our projects. And I'd just like to highlight um, work at Studio MLA on the LA River that demonstrates how we can draw down carbon in the landscapes. Now, their project revitalizes upper portions of the Los Angeles River. And while focusing on equity and resilience for communities surrounding this part of the river, their projects will restore and add natural habitats, sequester over 12,000 tons of carbon annually, creating greener, healthier neighborhoods for future generations. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jose to share with you more about taking steps for climate resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pamela. And, um, I don't have to tell you those were, it was a tough act to follow here, so I'll try to do justice to this. Um, so going forward um, uh, under climate resilience, and um, ASLA will provide education and examples to support landscape architects in preparing communities to a changing world. ASLA will develop and connect members with resources to learn about the projected climate, climate impacts of today and the future, helping them to evolve practices to better respond to the climate emergency through planning and design. Now, think about ASLA, all of us, and the membership to be the mycelia of this ecosystem. Uh, to support ASLA and advance our profession, the work has, for us has just begun. We all have a copy of, the, of this document as of today. And now it is our charge to read it and contribute to make it better by expanding resources, sharing examples of our work, updating metrics, and sharing successes and failures. Objective number four focuses on expanding ecological services to improve climate resiliency. Key strategies include think ahead, Use the latest models and update design criteria to minimize future risks. Manage water wisely. There's only one water, not multiple waters, on this planet. Consider reconnecting the hydrologic cycle in all your projects and understand the nexus of water and energy. Support self-reliant ecosystems. Strive to embed resiliency and capacity for adaptation and understand evolution and succession. Support cool green public infrastructure and recognize that these are dynamic systems. So the operating words here are monitoring and adaptive management. This is a changing media that we move into and try to improve the outcomes of our work. Objective number five, protect, conserve, and enhance biodiversity. Key strategies include protecting existing uh, ecosystems by minimizing disturbance and maintaining connectivity. Restore disturbed landscapes, including building healthy soils. 
reestablish bioregionally appropriate plant communities, support habitats by restoring missing links and enable energy and nutrient cycling, and facilitate species migration, that includes us, to allow for adaptation and survival. And survival. Objective number six, incorporate ecologically sound land management practices. Strategies include prioritize health and well-being for all life forms. Think biocentrically because we all depend on each other. Create urban forest canopies, maximize biomass and shade, minimize abiotic environments where possible. That's not always left out of the equation in our projects. But for every place that an abiotic or environment exists, there's no life associated with it. Reduce wildfires, manage landscapes to limit fuel loads, prevent landslides, understand the hydrology of place, think about a watershed as your smallest unit planting unit. Manage invasives, replace with native plants to increase biodiversity for they are the result of coevolution and adaptation over millennia. Do not take advantage of that intelligence and that knowledge. It would be foolish for any one of us to under undertake one of these projects. Include risk and emergency management in community planning. Think ahead and plan for future disturbance events, which they will occur, and that has to be part of the planning process. Objective seven support regenerative local agriculture and increase food security. We do that by protecting existing agricultural lands. Green fields should be producing food, should be sustaining life, should not be developed for housing and projects that ex eliminate you know, living systems. Um, for as much as green of a project that you're trying to do, whatever is working there is important that we preserve. Um, demonstrate the value of productive landscapes, including economic and health benefits. Support local food supplies, food supplies rather, reduce transportation costs and embed carbon and strengthen local economies by limiting transferring of resources. That's energy, food, money, all of that included. Encourage alternative farming techniques, eliminate the use of synthetic Fertilizers, as we heard a couple of days ago, you got to give up that relationship sometimes. Rely on soil biology, which is under us, for us to take advantage of, like it has happened forever in this planet, you know, to optimize nutrient cycling and improve yields. The consequence of that is that we will have diversified crops to realize economic resiliency understanding that there's a seasonality to the media where we practice. So don't try to all eat blueberries in the northern hemisphere, you know, in the winter time. There is a carbon footprint to be paid for that. And I think that there's, um, there's four metrics here that are significant here. Tall order, but here they go. Meet biodiversity positive of 10% net gain, as the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration proposes. In terms of biodiversity, protect 30% of terrestrial, coastal, and ocean ecosystems by 2030. You don't think about that, ask Ayana. It will tell you a little bit about what this means. Develop cities to meet 40% canopy cover, as recommended um, by at the American Forest Association. And all projects address future flood, fire, drought risk, and achieve zero stormwater runoff for all projects. There are extraordinary samples of our colleagues doing work. Ada Curtis created the concept of restoring historic Everglades wetlands at the federal complex of Miramar in Florida which now manages all the stormwater and increases biodiversity and acts as a carbon sink. 
This is a good example of stacking functions, finding multifunctionality, multivalence in all the landscapes that we develop. There's not enough room for all of us. We have to stack functions. We have to be efficient with resources. And that way, we would make a significant contribution to this issue. And now I'm going to turn it over to extraordinaire Diane um, to tell us a little bit more about climate agency. Okay, um, now we're going to shift over to our equity goal. Um, our first initiative um, for climate agency, landscape architects will increase support for equity and equality, rights of nature, food security, and the right to clean water and air, green spaces, housing, affordable, and accessible transportation for all. For centuries, policy decisions about land use, zoning, transportation, and other aspects of the built and natural environments have resulted in negative health, safety, and economic impacts on black, indigenous, and people of color. Advancing equitable community development is core to all climate action by 2040. ASLA will provide training and guidance to landscape architects on engaging and empowering communities, developing equitable outcomes that rely on equitable processes, supporting increased investment in community-based climate solutions. ASLA will work with organizations to identify and help reverse historic inequities. Efforts will include facilitating partnerships with indigenous, underserved, and historically marginalized communities to address past and current inequities. Planning and designing climate solutions that fairly distribute benefits of climate-related investments is important. Objective one, build community. Key strategies, recognize past injustice, know yourself, start listening, then share, Focus on what matters most. Objective two, understand climate injustices. Key strategies, unearth community knowledge, identify issues, go to the people. Objective three, use communication tools and techniques. Key strategies, develop a plan for community collaboration, Two, gather data. Three, support community involvement through analytical tools. Four, organize and synthesize. Five, implement and evaluate. Objective four, explore pathways to financial sustainability with communities. Key strategies, development driven. Two, fees, assessments, and taxes. Three, leveraging federal funds. Four, other people's money. Five, other important options, foundations, et cetera, from private and nonprofit sector, nonprofit sector. And the key four metrics for success include justice, advanced community development, supporting federal programs, such as Justice 40 initi Initiative and EPA Environmental Justice Programs. Two, jobs. ASLA's efforts support the creation of new green businesses and jobs across all communities, both rural and urban. Three, capacity. ASLA has built internal capacity to support a series of workshops, training, and mentorship for practitioners and educators based on equitable zero emissions growth. Four metrics. ASLA has developed an equity measure that must be applied when executing all goals of the action plan. Xing Wen Sheng is a landscape architect. Here's an example, educator and researcher dedicated to co-designing quality, sustainable, and resilient environments with communities. In a recent service learning studio, her students 
worked collaboratively with a charter school in the historically underserved neighborhood in South Phoenix, Arizona. The five-acre school requires this fire, the Five Acre School campus experiences persistent environmental justice issues, including flooding, excessive urban heat, and poor air quality. Thank you. We're going to move on to Sarah. And our second initiative under the uh, equity goal is cultural empowerment. The initiative here commits us to respecting and working with indigenous land managers and local knowledge systems to mitigate the impacts of the climate crisis and continue to working toward reconciliation. ASLA has committed to supporting and respecting indigenous led movements that aim to reclaim ancestral lands along with the cultural, spiritual, ecological and healing benefits that come with the land. As the climate crisis accelerates, indigenous cultures, underserved and underrepresented communities have already been and will continue to be disproportionately impacted. When working on projects and issues that intersect with underserved cultures, landscape architects can support community-led processes for self-determination, beginning with deep listening and knowledge sharing. Under the Cultural Empowerment Initiative, the field guide outlines objectives and key strategies for us as practitioners, including objective five, learn from indigenous communities through collaboration. Key strategies here include listening first, engaging with indigenous communities early and often, being generous with your time as a designer and compensating indigenous people for their time and labor. Enriching your discovery process, including researching traditional and contemporary indigenous science and land management practices to inform a more sustainable future. Make space for new futures. Indigenous ways of knowing and being can evoke and inspire new narratives and visions. Develop long-term collaborative relationships with the power to influence decision-making. And recognize the rights and traditional territories of indigenous peoples while identifying and respecting indigenous governments and authority structures. Objective six is to show respect through land acknowledgements. And I would add, if and only if you're respectfully engaging with indigenous people's input over the sustained period of time to co-create these land acknowledgements in deference to their leadership on the subject. Key strategies are to start with humility and self-reflection, to clearly acknowledge truths about displacement, genocide, assimilation, and forced removal, and to show respect using indigenous place names as appropriate. Objective seven is plan and design project work with indigenous peoples. Key strategies including co-planning and co-designing, adopting indigenous science to inform design work, and following existing guidance from the International Indigenous Design Charter when working on projects involving the representation of indigenous culture. We'll know we've succeeded when we can confidently say that we're hitting these key metrics, including awareness. ASLA has expanded cultural awareness of indigenous people and landscape projects on unceded lands, working toward reconciliation. Knowledge creation. ASLA and its members support indigenous science and design knowledge creation through data collection and visualization to help address the climate crisis in tribal communities. Relationships. ASLA and its members are trusted by local, underserved, or underrepresented communities, especially as it relates to equity and climate issues. And education. ASLA provides training and mentorship for practitioners and educators regarding community self-determination and cultural liter literacy. Uh, we're already doing this work. We just need to be doing much more of it. A great example of supporting cultural empowerment is Dr. Austin Allen's work with the Claiborne Corridor in the um, Innovation District and uh, the Gentilly neighborhood in New Orleans. He also works with local communities in Joppe and Dallas, Texas, and plans to manage stormwater with the communities for a change in climate on a 200-acre site. Dr. Allen works with the neighborhood's South Central Civic League as they involve the community in the future of a set of lakes, which are part of a U.S. Army Corps of Engineers project built to handle massive amounts of stormwater for downtown Dallas. And now we're going to move to our third overarching goal, which is advocacy. And um, the first initiative under the advocacy banner is climate leadership. 
Landscape architects are uniquely positioned to galvanize and lead a built environment response to the climate and biodiversity crises. We will continue to collaborate with clients, suppliers, and allied professions to champion climate positive design. ASLA will raise the visibility of the unique qualifications of landscape architects to provide climate and biodiversity crisis solutions and to build strategic partnerships to strengthen collaborative action. The plan calls on ASLA to amplify communications about how landscape architects mitigate, uh, sequester carbon and mitigate the changing environment effects, thus elevating the role of landscape architects into higher levels of decision making. Through communication efforts, we'll build support for nature-based solutions to the climate and biodiversity crises. Education and training for ASL ASLA members will increase our effectiveness in strategically advocating for climate positive design policies while also advancing equity and economic development. Objective one under climate leadership is to engage the public. Key strategies include engaging the public about landscape architecture through media outreach and simply getting out there, attending and lecturing at events and conferences both within and outside of our field. Objective two, work with elected officials and public servants. Uh, key strategies include creating um, a strategy for reaching out and what your specific advocacy goals and asks will be with policymakers, targeting who to reach, and possibly hiring a lobbyist at a state chapter level to advance climate uh, positive legislation and policies. Objective three, support employee health and well being. Be proactive. Consider evaluating your organization through an equity and social justice lens, maybe even through a third party like the Just Certification or a B Corporation program. One of the most basic ways you can support uh, health and well being is by creating a healthy work environment with fair labor practices. And third, investigate ways to support employees coping with climate change distress. Objective four build climate coalitions. Build relationships for strategic collaborations. Determine targeted items for collaboration. Build local climate coalitions and organize roundtables for discussions. And objective five, guide policies. Develop, guide, and plan policies related to nature-based systems, community planning and design, underserved communities, transportation, agriculture, and greenhouse gas emissions. Some of the key metrics for success for the Climate Leadership Initiative include policy milestones. ASLA's policy and climate action plan objectives have influenced and shaped local, state, and federal policy on climate action. Growth, ASLA has developed a network of economists and market analysts on zero emissions growth opportunities for the landscape architecture profession. Change, ASLA is a leading convener of landscape architecture product manufacturers and spearheading efforts to achieve zero emission supply chain. And convene, collaborate with allied partners and resilience and social justice organizations on a climate summit to support knowledge sharing, dialogue, and climate action. And again, we're already doing this kind of work. April Phillips has demonstrated climate leadership by designing the VF Outdoor Campus in Alameda, California to be a beautiful, resilient place that stores more carbon than it emits. This campus received LEED Platinum rating and a Bay Friendly Landscape Certification score of 124 points through its design. I'm going to hand it over to Vaughn. So here we are. I'm so happy to be here because um, we've been working on this for so many years and this is an incredible team. And, uh, Pamela and I have been working together since she organized all of the different ASLA organizations in Philadelphia to talk about what they're doing so that we start to understand what we're doing and what we're not doing. And so, it, you know, I feel like we've got this great goal now we've gotten here and we have a lot to, <laughs> a lot to continue to do. So um, it's, it's uh, we got that on there, okay. So Global Alliance, and thinking about this in the big picture, I, the thing that's so important and what I think we pulled together a good start on in this climate action plan is to think about scale all the time. So we have to think about the globe. There are no fences and boundaries between one ecosystem and another ecosystem, between one country and another country, between the water and the land, that we 
can't, uh, we have to work at that scale all the time. So I, I say, even if you're designing, which unfortunately some of us, this is what we do sometimes, even if you're designing the planting around a parking lot, think about all those other scales every time. Think about how it's changing because everything we design is for change. Think about how it's going to change in the future, get informed. Think about the community in which it resides. Think about the watershed and just keep expanding that thinking so you're thinking about all those connections because that's another thing. And, and these are themes that I think are reflected so well throughout this plan. But specifically about Global Alliance, one of the main things is advancing the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, and expanding the collaboration. That's really um, what we're trying to do with the Global Alliance. And this really has its roots in what we've been working on the last two or three years, really intensely, about really cooperating with IFLA. Um, as, uh, I mean, Pamela already mentioned this at the beginning, but I think it's worth coming back to that we worked with the international community and with IFLA to actually create the IFLA climate commitment that, this, that ASLE then became a signatory to, the smart XCOM, that said, of course we want to do this. And we're really working on that level. And Pamela is uh, doing, going to COP27 now. Uh, we had uh, a lot of influence in COP26, working with Architecture 2030. So it's all part of these collaborations that work at all these different levels and that are building up to something. Um, one thing about the SDGs that I just want to mention, if, I, if some people think those are something sort of abstract and that you can kind of go and look at them on the website, you're not thinking about how meaningful they are to apply in our daily lives, in our projects, and everything we do. And we should have them up on our wall. It's a good little checklist to do. It's another kind of checklist that really can have deep meaning for the long future. And I, I was always so impressed if you get to listen to recordings of our great Hazel Henderson, which was one of the great climate activists of the 20th century, and really is one of the reasons we actually started to address air pollution because she had the white suit from her baby living in New York City when she first immigrated here from Britain. Unfortunately, she passed this year, so she's someone we really need to think about it right up. But she is the greatest proponent and speaking loudly and strongly for years, both by writing and just even last year I heard her again just make a great appeal of we should be measuring the economic progress by the SDGs, not the GNP, GDP. You know, we, if how, how much gross domestic product we have is not what makes a better world. It's all of these things of how we create human health and well-being. So I think we really, um, we need to recognize how fundamentally this is. Now, the ASLA has supported and been part of the policy supporting of the SDGs uh, since they were first formed, I think it was 2015, um, with, and, the, and then countries have developed specific goals to do relative to this. Uh, but we, and we mostly have focused on the kinds of things we work with daily in our projects. At that time, we're thinking about clean water, life and, on Earth, and you know, these kinds of things. But, one of the things that's so great about this climate action plan, and I think we've heard some on this quite a bit, is the fact that we're focused on justice and equity, that we have to bring everybody, if we're all in this together, so if there's some people we're ignoring and not taking care of in terms of our environment, it's not gonna work for any of us. And I think it really ties back to, what, you know, this is all tying back to what we heard first thing yesterday, when we had the brilliant discussion in the, uh, the opening session that hopefully most of you were able to, to hear, sometimes you've got to stop saying, if we don't do this, if we don't do this, what do we do? And that's something the SDGs do for us. So as we evolve, let's look at that in a broader and broader way. So we have some goals specifically tied to Global Alliance. Goal five, embody the SDGs that we just talked about. And, um, Goal five is also to go global. And so we are really concentrating on this now and there's a lot of, of different aspects of that. Um, and these are just, again, just like everything else that we've done in this climate plan, we've tried to develop metrics and goals and ways to 
evaluate, are we being successful? So again, it's back to the SDGs. It's uh, how do we collaborate? I think that's the, one of the biggest words in this whole document. It's all about collaboration and how we work and leave our egos at the door and how do we, how do we work as a group. It's about the support that we get by sharing research. So one of the things we've had a great emphasis on in working on this as we worked hard on it all year and tried to compile things is we were building on what we're already doing. We're talking about where we need to go beyond that so that it's not a static thing. <laughs> These are things we continue to need to, to work on and we need to let everybody know about it. So this is an open document. This is a model. It can be a model for all the different things we can do with each other at all these different scales. And we can share this widely. And it's going to also benefit our profession and benefit the SLA because the more people know about us, the better leadership we can provide and the better projects we can do, the better we can gather money and help communities get funding for these systems, so um, the communication is the other big part of that. And how do we better communicate and keep communicating? So I, I challenge that that's one of the things that we as landscape architects and members of the SLA need to do is really work on our communication of how do we talk to people about this? How do we, we, we have to enter into the communities and the language and the direct impacts. And that's kind of where I came back to Hazel Henderson again. She, you know, was not an educated person and, and came and, and saw these problems in her environment and she decided to do something about it. You know, and she formed organizations, wrote books, <laughs> and did all these things to have this huge impact. And that's the kind of way we need to think. It's, it's how you do that outreach and communicate about this in a positive way. So, so I'm going to briefly go over our next steps. We might even have time for a few questions in here. <laughs> and um, so what we're doing, we have the, the we formally built in ways to keep this updated and to look at it and remember that you don't just make a plan and then just kind of wander on and hope that it's being fulfilled. So it has all these very direct actions. Um, the field guide is so important in that respect because there are so many references. We've really tried to accumulate and build on what all of us as individuals brought to this process, what feedback we got from members and from all the programs and the things that we've been doing all these years and, and to consolidate those, to get those in one place. So it's full of links. You have probably, I mean, we've all been going out and learning and doing and talking to our friends and all these things for the next couple of days. So you've already downloaded it, but you haven't begun to read the 94 or some pages of the field guide yet. But it's so rich, you can just go in there and you can click and we're accumulating this all together and working on the web page. And we're going to make this interactive on the web page so people can kind of find what they want to go to without having to kind of keep paging through something. And that's, it's got its own challenges. So thanks to the staff that's working very hard on that uh, too. So you'll see this evolving and changing a lot, particularly over this next, this year and next year where we have some very immediate goals and things that the SLA is going to work on. So um, we are going to do really a formal update and this will be, there'll be new people coming into this and, and we need to hear from everybody and hear the contributions. We're going to find really good ways that you can go on the website and figure out how to contribute because that's always the question. Oh yeah, I want to let them know this, but how do I do that? Who do I write to? Where do I put it? So we're going to make sure we get that information out to members right away and we have it all consolidated on the web page even right now that you can go to and find all of these things. So, and they're going to work on the highest priority, but I think probably as all of us know who've been working on different kinds of planning and, and implementation of long range plans and communities and things, well, you do the highest priority, but you also do some of the things that are easiest to do. Grab hold of the things we can do most easily and we can accomplish most quickly. They're building on our, our, our current successes and future successes. So we'll be looking at that and then we'll do this re formal review at least every five years. But frankly, I think that's going to, I think this is going to be such a living document because one of the things we all have to do is innovate and try things because we don't have all the answers, but we have the brains and the tools and the, and the skill sets and can collaborate with other people to bring that all together and figure out, okay, how can we accelerate this, 
this climate action so that we start to slow down <laughs> the, the heating of the planet, but we also have to constantly recognize it's not going to stop. Because if nothing else, even if we stop the, the emissions today, the oceans have so much heat that it's still going to be issues with flooding, there's still going to be all kinds of things that we haven't even, almost haven't had started to experience. So, so we need to just get all these ideas in and try things and, and really convince, that's where policy comes in, because we really need to convince agencies and that we've got to change our policies and try things. And I think we're getting, so that's a communication thing we need to do. We also are going to really be looking at the rating. Um, and I'm excited that we have honeycomb strategies on board uh, that will help set some baselines this year with the emission studies and we'll really be putting out new goals of how we can help on the emissions side in particular. But, but all other kinds of things, they're thinking so broadly about things that have the impact on, on global warming and, and how we live and how we survive. So um, we have this process that we're going to do with these thinking about the things that are emerging, developing, and it's significant and successful, and really try to figure out so we can help people to say, okay, which of these things are really working really good, and if you want to do this, this will be... So that whole idea that, that Jose talked about of successes and failures and documenting them and keeping track of them. So be sure and read that plan. Thank you, I can abide your lives. And I'd say be sure and read the SDGs and... And we'll let you know how to get us information to us. But we also uh, are going to be down in the expo. We're going to go on to continuing the conversation, although we'll have a couple of minutes here for questions first. But any of you that can come down and ask us any questions down there, we'll be in base camp for an hour. And we also have, and I'm one of the people that will also be there at the pavilion through the middle of the day until 1.30 or 2 o'clock. They can just come ask ask about the climate action and, and be sure and ask anybody about the, that's wearing these pins because we've all read all this stuff and we might not be able to pull it out of our heads but we can know where to go to look at it. So um, so thank you very much and uh, Pamela, do you want to take a few questions? Or? Does anybody... <laughs> We have seven minutes, so does anybody have any comments or questions they'd like to make right now? Yeah. I do. Um, I wondered if anybody had any uh, positive stories they could tell about changing their development code. Uh, it's something I've been involved in in Austin for the last 10 years, and I've just gotten so frustrated. So I just wondered, um, you know, as landscape architects, obviously we understand how to build things smarter, but when the code sucks, the developers get to do whatever they want. Um, and so I'm just trying to figure out if, if there are any stories about, uh, good stories about being able to affect your code. Yes, I think we all have some good stories and some frustrating stories. <laughs> Does anybody have anything they particularly want to say yeah, about? I can share a specific example. Um, I've been working with um, Toronto for, I don't know, the past year or so to update their green building standards. And so they're now including um, the, the requirement to measure the carbon emissions for projects and to document that through, um, through the, some of the tools that we have available. And so um, that's, a, that's a small example, but I see that it's already coming in, in um, building codes changing. Um, there are many cities that have already started adopting um, embodied and um, our operational emissions requirements and now that's coming there's multiple cities in Europe now that have embodied carbon um, emissions requirements for um, um, several cities and so that's that's the wave that's coming and so the more that we can advocate for that you know that we're supporting our cities and communities um, this this is going to change it's likely going to change fast so I think when we're you know the Keep bringing it up as much as we possibly can and going and asking the questions. I think it's also the same with sea level rise, too. We, we're likely going to have to be you know, filling, adding some fill into our waterways to adapt our communities to protect from sea level rise. And San Francisco is, is facing that right now, which goes against current regulations. But uh, again, we are going to have to evolve. And um, so I think those are some examples of things that are happening out there right now. Do you all have any answers to share? Well, I can just say that um, in New Orleans, post Katrina, 
Um, they instituted, uh, which is good, they have a stormwater management office and any project where it's over 10,000 square feet, you have to have a stormwater management plan. And it's, that's really wonderful because that's really important and it's also increased work for landscape architects there. But um, yeah, and that's enforced and in code and they developed the whole office for it. If I can also add that one of the main things we've done as part of this, sorry, do a go again, I always hit the microphones. <laughs> that as part of, we would develop that policy guide that we, um, for what kinds of policies uh, have positive impact on climate change. And we have incorporated that into the Climate Action Plan, but it are, is also available uh, freestanding. And it's, and it's very useful for taking to, to public officials and really starting to try to educate them. And so uh, one thing that we've had a lot of success with, I worked um, for 25 years in the Hampton Roads area on the East Coast. And uh, we actually had the, the more progressive parts of the communities. We were coming together in terms of all these but 17 jurisdictions in one little area. And they, the, the different um, cities would participate in looking at and listening to people, what impact will it have if I do this action or I do that action, so that they start to have the information they need to justify making changes. So getting involved in that process of going to the, the different uh, departments that are um, actually implementing codes and working with them to convince those elected officials why they should make changes is really helpful because they have a lot that they have to figure out and so it's a real one good really good volunteer way to help change these regulations so sometimes I think that um, evaluation of your own projects over time and comparison between what actually has been modeled to comply with regulations versus what has happened with uh, with uh, uh, storm events, I think is important. Um, years ago, we did a project in Philadelphia where the models suggested that the site will be able to uh, deal with a stay on volume of uh, an inch or so uh, for the project. And uh, long and behold, we had a significant uh, storm event, and the, pro the project had no uh, runoff discharge after three and a half inches. So that, that is a that is an increase of 350% of what actually was uh, measured versus what was modeled and approved. That resulted in uh, the Philadelphia Water Department considering uh, a criteria of adding 20% of uh, uh, moisture holding capacity of biosoils bio um, as a tool for everybody to utilize and meet their uh, rather progressive stormwater management criteria. So that, you know, that is where practice turns into advocacy, where you are really making a difference. And now everybody can do a bio swell or a, or a, or a, or a, uh, a rain garden and take credit for the connection between plants and soil. whoopie do, right? Did you know about that for a while? Well, now it is part of the regulations and that makes a difference. And maybe as, as the regulations change and instead of going from 95 percentile it has to go to 98 percentile these elements are going to actually show that they have this multifunctionality and they become part of the project it's embedded in it i mean all the projects right now that we're working on stormwater management becomes an economic issue you know and by stacking those functions we're making developers be able to green their projects because there's a benefit to that the other thing that you know you want to do is you want to when you have the opportunity, you know, measure also the things that are actually happening in the project in terms of water uh, quality. Uh, when you're looking at projects that are actually using constructed wetlands to clean wastewater, the possibilities of using the byproduct of that process to actually sustain a landscape were not feasible in Pennsylvania. The FIPS project, the Center for Sustainable Landscape in you know, demonstrated that that class B water could actually be applied to the site. Therefore, reducing runoff discharge, managing the 100-year storm, and closing that, you know, water cycle, right? So that's it, the power of this, the opportunities that we have, if we think about connecting all these dots, is immense. So think about, you know, 
a thousand of those projects happening that the society can actually you know, contribute to. It's a huge, it's a huge contribution, and we need to put it out there. You've been standing there very patiently as we run out of time. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I just, it, I'm hoping it's a simple answer, but, and I'm very excited to read the plan. I haven't had a, a minute to do that just yet, and I'll probably read it on the plane ride because it's a long one. Um, <laughs> And, um, and maybe we're going about to talk about this in the next piece of this, but I was looking at the metric slides, and there, there, are there actually like measurable pieces to this? Because we, we still have kind of like aspirational metrics, I guess you could say. But maybe it's more specific in the field guide, and maybe hopefully this is just a yes or no question. But. Yes, yes, yes. we did it. And, and that's one thing I think we'll keep de developing. Okay. I think that's something with a lot of input that we can help to say what are some other metrics we can apply. Okay. But we know that's really important and we have some good groundwork on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank so you all. we're done. <laughs>